Good evening, everyone. We welcome you to Sisters for Sisters, Inc., The Love Talk. Every month, especially during the pandemic, we basically had outreach and conversations to help us understand what was going on in the house behind the screen during the pandemic. We are so grateful to have you all on this evening. We will continue to do these engaging community conversations in terms of helping our community address the issues, including domestic sexual violence and human trafficking. And tonight, as we recognize January as national, um, they call it slavery and human trafficking uh, prevention month. And we'll find out more after we greet our guests. But we always begin, everything we do in Sisters is all about prayer. And so we certainly want to welcome our sister all the way from Los Angeles, California, who has a background in law enforcement and is an advocate against domestic violence and women um, rights. And that is our sister, Rita Hall. Rita, welcome. Thank you for joining us and leading us in prayer on tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Carolyn. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening with a mouth full of praise and a heart full of gratitude that you have equipped all of us with a compassionate heart that reaches out to women who are in situations beyond their control. We thank you, Father God, that you are going to break the chains of sex trafficking, domestic violence, and slavery, Father God. For too long, women have been disenfranchised, disrespected, and unprotected. But it's a new day, Father. And that's mm -hmm. primarily based on people like Carolyn, who bring people together on this topic from across the nation and around the world. The more we spotlight this, Father God, the more we can make inroads into stemming this tide and eventually eliminating this. So Lord, go with each and every speaker this afternoon. I know you have deposited a powerful message in each one of them, and we are eagerly awaiting what they have to say. So Lord, I just say thank you, thank you, thank you for being the mighty God you are and your powerful son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sister Rita. That was so powerful and so on time as it always is. We thank God for Sister Rita because of her years of service uh, with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. She not only does that, but she is an advocate, as I mentioned, uh, against domestic violence. She's seen some stories we can only read about in the newspaper. And I thank her because she is the co-founder of our Handbags of Hope Across America, which is a program that helps women and families impacted by domestic violence and helping them in shelters with toiletries, care, um, all kinds of cards and encouraging books, things of that nature. That's what we've been doing. And as today, I think we're about 20,000 handbags across America that she and I, Sisters for Sisters Inc. and Handbags of Hope across America have done to eradicate not only the domestic and sexual violence, but also cases of human trafficking that we probably probably didn't know about. You know what I mean? It's all Sister Rita for that powerful prayer and for your service. We want to welcome those of you that are joining us. Sisters for Sisters Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering women and girls and transforming their lives in mind, body, and spirit. And one of our signature services is the love movement. And the love movement represents leave out violence every day. And as I mentioned, uh, we've been hosting the love talk on a monthly basis and during the pandemic the heightened part of the domestic um, violence um, activity we were hosting every single week so we're just glad to be back in 2023 happy new year to everyone is tuning in we're so excited because we know that it's a new day january is that special month and 
it almost slipped me by. And I was just like, wait a minute, hold up. We have got to educate and equip and empower our community so we'll know the signs and things to look for and we will understand exactly how we can make an impact but education is the key so i wanted to just share something with you we have a special guest on tonight and i'm so glad to have her but president biden has proclaimed january 2023 as national human trafficking prevention month reaffirming his administration's commitment to protect and empower survivors of all forms of human trafficking, to prosecute traffickers, and to bring an end to human trafficking in the United States and around the world. So we're excited to hear that the, uh, the nation's highest leader is taking a public stand on this issue. Um, I wanted to share something with you all, how we got into this piece was the fact that so many of our women and our girls are impacted by not only the domestic and sexual violence, but human trafficking. And I wanted to have one of our guests come on. She actually helped us to identify, she's a Lyft driver. Her name happens to be Carolyn. And she happened to see a young lady wandering with little clothes. And she had been met a gentleman on um, social media, or no, a dating app. And she came here and the gentleman was well-respected. He was an attorney in Prince George's County. I'm sorry, a physician in Prince George's County. And she trusted and she came here and he um, tried to convince her to go into some trafficking. And we ended up putting her in a hotel and she flew out that night and she was safe and was so grateful. We never ever know who and what, but one thing I'm looking forward to is we have a great guest who's gonna teach us and educate us so we can, you know, keep our radar up. So we have sister, uh, just, I'm saying her name wrong, Forgive me, y'all. I'm from the South. And if your name is not Mary and Sally, we're going to have some challenges some days. But Sister Gomez is Director of Equity and Community Engagement, and she brings a wealth of experience, more than a decade, working with vulnerable communities in Maryland and the District of Columbia. Ms. Gomez graduated at the Maryland Equity and Inclusion Leadership Program from the University of Maryland's School of Policy and MCCR. She has worked with vulnerable youth and community organizations and helping us in this area of human trafficking. We are so grateful to have Jatina Jetna, my son, thank God. Let me tell y'all, sometimes glasses work and sometimes they don't. But this subject is so important. I want you all to invite people to come on because truly we want to be equipped to save the lives of some of the young women and men and children who are caught up in human trafficking. Sister Jetna, thank you so much for your patience with me tonight. And thank you for joining the Love Talk. We're glad to have you this evening. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I hope it is a talk because I wanna make sure that we're having an interactive conversation. I don't wanna just be talking at you guys. Please tap me, ask me questions, anything that you guys um, you know, that want to clarify, I'm happy to do so. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get us started. Um, and our presentation is called Human Trafficking 101 because we're going to the basics. We're gonna go ahead and um, our goals for tonight are gonna be four. We want to define human trafficking. We want to discuss the risk factors. We want to identify the different types of trafficking. And we want to learn some tactics used by the traffickers. So that's what we want to leave with at the end of this presentation. So let's start off with some myths. We've all heard the story of the white ban. We've all seen things on social media. We've, we've all heard someone's encounter or, or a friend of a friend has some sort of encounter with human trafficking. There are four big myths that we always hear about. The big one is that it only involves sex. And that's not true. We have labor and sex trafficking. So it doesn't always just involve sex. 
The second thing we hear about often is that it only happens to young girls. And that's not accurate. Adult women can and are trafficked every single day, both for labor and sex trafficking. We also hear that it cannot happen to male, that it only happens to women. And again, that's not accurate. It happens to children. It happens just to adults. It happens to male, to women, to members of the LGBTQ plus community. And another myth we hear about is that it doesn't happen in the U.S., like not in my backyard. It's not happening here. I see it in the movies. We've all seen the movie Taken, where it happens in Europe. And, you know, that's where it takes place very far away from our backyard. And that's not accurate. It can, as you mentioned, it can happen um, just in a lift, a lift driver with a, you know, and then it can happen with somebody very as you mentioned as well. So it can be anywhere near you. You don't know what's going on in your neighbor's home. Okay, so now that we have cleared the air on some of the ideas of, that we had before on what human trafficking is, I want to give you guys a definition so everyone has the same understanding. So human trafficking is the criminal exploitation for profit of women and girls, men and boys for commercial sex and forced labor, okay? It's, and, and we have to focus a lot on the for commercial sex, and I will clarify what commercial sex is next, and forced labor. The traffickers use the big three to entrap their victims, forced, fraud, and coercion. And so they use this to uh, entrap their victims and compel them to work in exploitative conditions for the traffickers' enrichment. So we'll, we'll break this down throughout the presentation and we'll go over a little bit farther um, as to these three, but those are our big three, force, fraud, and coercion. So I said we were gonna clarify a little bit more about um, commercial sex. So there is an exception to the force, fraud, and coercion rule. So we just read that traffickers use force, fraud, and coercion to entrap their victims. Now, let's, Take it a step back. What is commercial sex? Commercial sex is the exchange form of money or goods for sexual services. That includes prostitution, stripping, pornography, but it also includes if someone is couch surfing and sleeping with, a, with someone to, in order to have a place to stay. You are exchanging something of value, which is shelter, in exchange for sexual services. That is, com that is considered commercial sex. So in the state of Maryland, any minor under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex is automatically a victim of trafficking. Again, any minor under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex is automatically a victim of trafficking. This is despite them, if the minor says that they have to the commercial sex, um, or whether or not we can prove that force, fraud, or coercion were present. We, if it's a minor involved, anyone under the age of 18 in commercial sex, that is automatically considered trafficking. Your youth exploited through commercial sex who do not have a trafficker are also victims of trafficking. And this is, where when we say youth that do not have a trafficker, we're discussing those on the internet. Um, that may not have any specific trafficker, that they may be sending pictures, um, they may be exchanging, it may be a, a thing of pornography, they may, it may be stripping. Um, if, a, if a minor under the age of 18 is involved in something like stripping because it's something of value and it's considered commercial sex, even if there is no trafficker involved, it is considered sex trafficking. So all you have to think about is under 18, Commercial sex equals sex trafficking. Please feel free to stop me at any point or if you see any questions come up, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. I know it's a lot of information. Okay, so now we, we kind of have a working definition of what trafficking is, the definition of trafficking. Now who can be, right? We all have an idea of this white band snatching young girls or in someone, um, in an alley, just coming by or snatching our kids after school, where in reality, it can be the person next door. It can be anyone. And that we basically, when we're discussing who can be a trafficker, it can be 
anyone. These are very sophisticated. It can be everyone from someone very sophisticated to somebody working in um, something in a very powerful position. So as you mentioned, it can be an ambassador, just like it can be a food service worker. It can be a restaurant manager, just like it can be the salon of, an, of uh, the manager of a nail salon. Anyone can be a trafficker. So focusing on, oh, that person doesn't look like a trafficker is not going to get us anywhere because anyone can look like, anyone can be a trafficker. I want us to keep this image in mind as we're going through the presentation, and it's going to be the AMP model, the acts, means, and purpose. So this is what makes it's it's like if you're making a, a, a soup and you want it to be chicken soup, you need these ingredients for it. This is the ingredients for it to be considered trafficking. You need the act, you need the means, and you need the purpose. So what happened, how did it happen, and why did it happen? So these are the four acts. This is how they happen, and they happen either for sex exploitation or labor exploitation. Acts, means, and purpose. So we figured out a little bit of what it is, who is usually a trafficker. We see that it, that it involves acts, means, and purpose. The, the what, how, and the why. Now we're, we are answering the how. How do these people entrap their victims? How do they find their victims? How do they isolate the victim? And it's very important to keep in mind this wheel of power and control. Um, in labor and sex trafficking, because this is a lot of the how. This is the how. But in we like to summarize it in four steps. This, the, they, this don't always happen in the same order. Um, these are not always the, the linear process, and this does not happen to all the victims in the same way. But this is a trend that we usually see. The trafficker first identifies the need of a victim. Then they start to fulfill the need. It's a process. It is not something that happens once and done. The trafficker is very sophisticated. They know who, how to identify their victim. And they, are, they know how to isolate a need and understand a need of a victim. Yeah. Then they start to fulfill that need, OK? As they start to fulfill that need, they remove any other sources of fulfillment for that need, okay? And then once those other sources of fulfillment have been removed and the, and the victim is fully dependent on the trafficker to fulfill that need, they start to force them into commercial sex or labor. So the best way to explain this is, um, the trafficker has identified the victim as a, as a runaway youth. It is someone who doesn't have a permanent home, who may, whose need may be shelter and just a loving environment. They're just, they're the basic needs, love and shelter. So they start to fulfill that need by giving the youth a place to hang out, a safe place to, to be, they, you know, someone that will listen to them, becoming the emotional support person that the youth becomes to, starts to develop an unhealthy relationship with because they become fully dependent on them for their emotional needs. Slowly that youth begins to, begins to ignore their friends, anybody else who um, they have, may have a relationship with and slowly focuses on their relationship with the trafficker. The trafficker becomes their everything because the trafficker may start saying, hey, that friend of yours that's in social media, that may not be a good friend. Oh, and you know, you guys just had a fight. Why are you still talking to them? So slowly but surely they start to strip away that those other sources of support. Once the victim is isolated, so they only have the trafficker as the main source of love and support in their life, the trafficker begins to exploit them. Oh, I have this need, you know, I don't want to talk to you about it. I just, you know, I have this need. I maybe, you know, I may be losing my home. You won't have a place to come to because I can't pay the rent. Maybe if you meet and hang out with some of my friends, you know, um, they may pay me for it. And 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 they slowly begin to to create to weave this thing where 
for the victim, it doesn't seem so bad. Like, oh, I'm just going to do my friend a favor. You know, they always do me favors. They may give me gifts. So why not one time? And that one time it starts to become this vicious cycle. Okay. And so that is how we summarize that how. So remember how I explained that it was the what, the how, and the why. So I'm expanding a little bit more on the how because we said the how was forced fraud or coercion. So these are some examples that I wanted to highlight. We all understand what forced is. So yes, we understand how when someone says the trafficker kidnapped me and that's how they forced me into commercial sex. So we understand what happened. What happened was the harboring, how it was kidnapping, and the why it was for commercial sex. But what if the how is fraud? They become, to, they start to be deceitfully enticing them with affectionate behavior, like I mentioned in my example. For labor, they start to withhold wages. So this person is, is that's completely financially dependent on their job is now and they've worked all this time, they spend, they uh, are expecting this check that they work for, now they're not getting it. Or what if the how is coercion? What if they start to threaten to abuse them with their legal cases? Like they know that you have, uh, that you're on parole, or they know that you have a history of being, you know, a, a, a runaway and getting arrested. And they say that, okay, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm gonna go ahead and call the police and let them know where you are, okay? Um, so those are some, some examples. I know a lot of people struggle to sort of think of a specific examples of coercion and fraud. So I always like to highlight those two because force is easier to sort of conceptualize. Most of us understand force. Most of us understand beating someone. But a lot of, this, of us don't understand coercion, that it may be creating dependency on a substance or on alcohol, that's coercion right there. So we understand the how, now we need to look into the who. Who are the victims that the um, traffickers are isolating and how, you know, who, how are they picking these vulnerabilities? Now, I want to start this off with the caveat that anyone can be a victim of trafficking, anyone who has a vulnerability that a trafficker can exploit, you can be a victim of trafficking. It just takes the right circumstances for someone to exploit. So this does not mean that a, a, a college educated, you know, let's use the, the example of a young lady cannot fall into trafficking because she came from a good life. That does not mean that. It just means that we have identified certain vulnerabilities that make that make victims more attractive to traffickers and more vulnerable to traffickers. So anyone that's marginalized, whether it's for race or ethnicity, religion or uh, immigration status, is at higher risk because they have a vulnerability that they can that can be easily exploited. We discussed the youth that run away, um, anyone experiencing homelessness, substance abuse, lack of educational opportunities. Um, we know that a lot of the times what we, how much we make or what we make is very much dependent mm -hmm. on our education. It's very much dependent on where we come from. A lot of um, the victims that we find come from a background of poverty, which is exploited then in order to create these situations for them. Um, I want to highlight people with developmental disabilities because a lot of people feel, may mistaken and think that it never happens to them and it happens to people with developmental, with any type of mental disability can happen. And above all, I wanted to highlight the systems in our society that make it possible for, for human trafficking to take place. So we have cycles of homelessness and joblessness, a criminal justice system and child welfare system that are not responsive as they should be to their, you know, to their survivors and mental and physical health um, outcomes. And in the center of it, you have racism. We 
a statistics after statistics show that young women of color are more prone to be victimized in and be made victims of human trafficking. That's just what we have found in studies. Race plays a role in human trafficking. So where does this happen? Basically it can happen anywhere where business is conducted or where everyday life is conducted. But what we found is that labor trafficking usually, you know, we found labor trafficking, our clients are, come from these industries. Um, I wanna ha highlight the nursing homes and home health industries because we often don't think of those when we think of labor trafficking. Um, the, the begging and the peddling, I think, I'm not the only one who's used to seeing someone in the corner with their child begging for money or asking for help saying they do not have a job. Sometimes this can be a trafficking situation. Sometimes we don't know if that person is forced into that type of um, in, into that type of environment, into that type of um, situation. Now, when it comes to sex trafficking, we usually see it in these industries. And for that, I wanted to highlight private residencies. Sex trafficking does take place in private residencies. When we think of sex trafficking, we may think of a street corner. Um, that's not it. It can happen, and it can happen online as well. What takes place online can be considered sex trafficking, whether there is a physical act or not. It can be considered sex trafficking. So I'm going to go into the signs. When I go over the signs, I like to explain with a caveat that you have to get a full picture and be familiar with what I was saying, the, the what, the how, and the why. So what happened? Were they transferring, harboring, and um, a, a victim? How did they do it? Force, fraud, or coercion, and then why for sex or labor trafficking? So when you're thinking of the science of trafficking, you're trying to paint a full picture. You're um, you're looking at signs like that maybe because the, you're looking at signs that may be similar to other uh, forms of victimization, such as you know domestic violence and child abuse. So you're trying when you're looking for trafficking, you have to look at the full picture and you have to look at those three things: the what, the how, and the why. So some examples of signs of sex trafficking can be uh, those that are frequently running away from home. If they're running away, they're running away for a reason. I've always said that I love working with youth because they tell you how it is, uh, but they also, um, you know, they're wonderful to work with. But um, I always, whenever they run away, my first question to them is, what are you running away from? Talk to me. As simple as that. What are you running away from? Um, a lot of the times victims of sex trafficking, have, they lack control over everything from their personal <laughs> schedules to their documentation to their location. It is not uncommon to ask a survivor of trafficking, where are you? And they don't know the state. You ask them for their address and they may not know it. That is a very big red flag. Um, you're looking at this uh, physical signs, like someone that's malnourished, uh, is wearing inappropriate clothing based on the weather and the conditions surrounding. You see a snowstorm and this person is wearing leggings and a crop top and you're you're wondering like, are you okay? Do you need some support? Um, so we're always vigilant. That it's not just one sign. Um, as you will see on the second page, and this is just sex trafficking, there are a lot of signs. So that's why I like to explain it in, as, a, as a piece of a puzzle. With youth, you see that there is a boyfriend or girlfriend who's noticeably older and controlling. You see that they're like, oh, I have to ask them if I can do this. You, oh, I can't, you know, so and so. I have to do everything. We are, we are learning, and I love spaces like this because as women of color, not only do we get support, but we're learning what healthy relationship signs are. And so it's not just dating someone that is older for our discomfort but it's also dating someone that is noticeably older and someone who is whose behavior is of concern 
So there shouldn't be a 14 year old dating a 23 year old. Okay, and then you, because you're thinking about developmentally, what is going on here? Okay, developmentally, what are you sharing with the 14 year old? And then you're looking at the behavior and you're like, if in, you, you're noticing a controlling pattern that this 14 year old has very little control over their movements without checking with the boyfriend or girlfriend. So when we look at signs of labor trafficking, they're very similar. Um, on the physical and everything, but we, we're looking at employment situation for labor trafficking. Um, when we're looking at youth, you're, we're looking at youth working without a school work permit uh, or permission from their parents. You know that if you're under a certain age as a youth, they need to have a certain permit. Um, they can only work a certain amount of hours if they're a student, and you're seeing that they've been worked extra amount of hours and they're not being paid for those hours and they don't seem to have much control over working those hours or not. Um, one of the biggest red signs for labor trafficking is living with an employer or having an employer listed as a student's caregiver. I'm not saying it cannot happen, but it's one of the most suspicious signs. We see that a lot in spas and nail salons where the where the workers live with the employer. You have to think about what happens if the employee chooses to leave the job. Can they leave the job if they live with their boss? So, you know, and, and, and that's where the next point comes in, having the desire to quit the job but not being allowed to do so or able to do so because the employer holds over a certain uh, level of power over this um, person. Then we're looking for emotional and signs and then personal finances. Um, those employees who own, who owe this enormous debt to their employers that are, they're never going to pay it, pay it off if they're making $15 an hour and they have to they live with the employer and I have to give them half of what they make every month to pay for their room and board and, and food and everything then they also owe them like $20,000 for bringing them over from their country that they're paying every month when is that worker ever going to be able to branch out and leave that employment situation you know, and again, we're looking at what, how, and why. Um, and then you're looking at, we're humans. We know how, we know what's normal and we know what's not. So you're looking at signs of fear, anxiety, depression, submission, tension, and nervousness. You're looking, you're reading another person. You're seeing like, this person does not seem comfortable. There's something off here. So if we know the signs, if we know what it looks like, why is it so hard to identify the victims? I'm gonna give you an average of five that we, five reasons that we encounter the most frequently, but there are many, many reasons. One of the main reasons is that human trafficking is a very covert crime, is a very lucrative crime. It is a, a multi-million dollar industry. And when I tell you that the traffickers want to make sure that, that their operations continue, they want to make sure that they continue. So a lot of the times the victims themselves do not know that they're victims of human trafficking. They think, I'm, I, oh no, I, you know, maybe domestic violence, interpersonal issues with interpersonal relationship. They feel like they may have chosen that life. There is a, a level of fear and shame because remember, these victims are not tied to a chain in a basement. So a lot of the times, the first thing people ask them is, why didn't you leave? If you don't know where you are, you don't have any legal documents, you do not know how to navigate the bus system, you have nowhere to go, how would you leave? And so a lot of the times is one of the biggest, one of the biggest barriers to uh, survivors being able to leave their situation is what's on the other side. Um, there is the power and control used by the trafficker. Remember what I told you, the trafficker took their time to identify their victim, to work on their victim. So they have a level of power and control that 
it's not easy to break. So that, that, that trafficker lives in the victim's mind. So they don't need to hit that person. If they hit them a few times, they don't need to hit them again for that person to be afraid of physical violence. If they went ahead and they, they uh, psychologically abused that person, they don't need to keep abusing them for them to have power or control over them. Um, and there is also this, this web of systemic racism as one of the, the root causes of human trafficking. We go all the way back to the fact that we're, we're living under systems that are inherently racist. And so when, as I mentioned, a lot of our survivors are survivors of color that may not present to the criminal justice system, the healthcare system as the ideal victim. So if they do not come to a doctor crying and, and with signs of bruising and maybe, you know, what we, what we ideally imagine a victim to look like, then they may not be believed. They are in a system where when they have a healthcare issue, the healthcare issue itself is not believed, let alone how would they believe that I'm that I'm going through this bizarre story of this guy that I met, that I dated, and I moved out of state with, and I've been with for this month is making me have sex with some people for money, and I don't even know how to leave. How, how would they believe me? When I work, in, you know, where, where this system is set up to not believe in me because I'm, you know, I am who I am. So I want to give you guys just an idea of how big the num the issue is in terms of scope with the reality, leaving you with the reality that we do not know what we don't know. <laughs> so there is a large number, there are a large number of cases that we don't know about. These are the number of reported cases to one source. So there is the national hotline and that if it's reported to the national hotline, we're able to track it. That's it. So the cases that are not reported, the cases where that do not come into this hotline, we don't know about. So there are tens to thousands to hundreds of thousands of victims within the US that are trafficked annually. So you see that range from tens to hundreds of thousands because we don't know the, the range. Since 2012, Maryland has been in one has been one of the top 20 states with the most reports of trafficking in the nation. And the reason for this is because the, the location of Maryland's location, we're like right in the middle. We have a number of major airports. We have the I-95, we have I-270, we have major um, highways. And then we have compounded of at the compounded effect of, effect of multiple, multiple vulnerable populations, such as foster youth, a lot of unaccompanied minors. Prince George's County receives an enormous amount of unaccompanied minors every year. We have a lot of, um, because we have a lot of international, um, maybe ambassadors and politicians and everything, we have a lot of domestic servants and we have a lot of agricultural workers. And, and we can't forget that there is a lot of the transnational gang presence. So all of this compounded is, um, is what makes Maryland one of the top 20 states um, with reports of trafficking. Now, when we look a little bit deeper and we're like putting, we hone in on Maryland. And again, this is what has been reported, not what has happened because we do not know what hasn't been reported. So those cases where, you know, the person didn't feel comfortable enough, those cases where trafficking went through as, as domestic violence, we don't have any of those numbers. But according to another source, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, in um, 2020, there were at least 136 human trafficking cases reported in that reference Maryland. And among those cases, the top venue for labor trafficking was domestic work. And for sex trafficking, it was hotel and motels. So out of those cases that are there that were reported to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center in 2020, most of the cases of labor trafficking were happening in domestic work. So the house cleaning, housekeepers, 
domestic work, and the sex trafficking was happening in hotels and motels. From June 2013, the same resource to May 2023, they have had over 679 reports of suspected child sex trafficking. And these were the ones that were screened in by CPS in one of, Mar of Maryland's 24 um, agencies. And again, these are the ones screened in. These were the ones that the system caught. What about those that is fall through the crack that we are not aware of, that the system just was not able to catch in time? So what can you do as, a, as, as an audience member? You're getting all this information. You're trying to figure out what can you do. So the first thing that you can do is if you suspect anything, there is the national hotline, which the number is right there in the center, 1-888-373-7888, where you're able to call anonymously. You can, um, if you have concerns, if you are adding three factors and you think it may be trafficking and you want to check with someone, you call that number and they'll be able to assist you. If there is a case that you're worried about, like you go to the nail salon, you talk to the person, the person has disclosed something to you and you're concerned, you call them and you're able to give that information. The next number is 233733 is for the same agency, but you can text. So this is where you can text. Um, again, same thing, and instead of calling, you don't feel comfortable calling, you just want to text and say, hey, I have this concern, I'm in Maryland, what can I do? You can um, text them. The second thing we need, we need people to become informed and advocate. We still have very old laws in the books in Maryland. There is, there is no reason why there should be such a thing as a child prostitute in Maryland. There shouldn't be we need better legislation, we need more information, we need more education, and that's where you come in. As a community member, you come in and you make those requests, you spread the word, you look for the training for your church, for your school group, you make sure that the information is spread and it's the right information. So you want to look for professionals who work in human trafficking to provide those trainings. And I'm going to just leave you with a little, of information, a little bit of information about my agency and what we do. So we are the University of Maryland Safe Center. Even though it says the University of Maryland, we work with the community. So any member, we work with anyone that has ever been trafficked, period. It can be currently trafficked 20 years ago, trafficked in a country outside of the United States or trafficked in the United States. The only requirement is that you have to be a survivor of trafficking. Everything is, we're a nonprofit, so everything is uh, free. And our, and our, we are the only multidisciplinary organization that serves survivors of human trafficking in Prince George's County. So what that means is that we're one-stop shop. We have mental health, legal, we have social services, everything within one place because we want our survivors to get everything they need in one place. Um, we provide, so we provide those direct services. We try to conduct research. We wanna fill in those gaps in knowledge. Like I told you, we don't know what we don't know. So we're looking at those numbers. We're trying to find out the scope of the problem so that we can keep educating the population. And like I told you to advocate, we're trying to pr uh, promote policy and advocate to make sure that we're supporting and empowering our survivors and we're promoting justice. We wanna promote social justice. And so these are the little, the cute little picture of the services that we have. Um, so we uh, have case management, mental health, legal services, economic empowerment. So those are all the services that we offer at the Safe Center. And again, they're free to survivors of human trafficking. And so last but not least, I'm going to leave this up uh, while I way for people to ask questions is our contact information. So on the left side is my contact information. And on the right side is our general center information. You can go on the website, look for, um, if you want to make a referral, if there's a friend or anything, you can fill out a form there. You can look for signs, resources. Um, that is all there on our website. 
So Sister Caroline, that's all I have for you guys right now. Please uh, let me know if you guys have any questions, anything that I can clarify. You were outstanding, outstanding. Let's give, I just have to give you a big Aww. hand because you truly educated me, Sister Jatna. That was so incredibly informative and I am so grateful to your information. I, I thought I knew a lot, but I learned so much more today. Your presentation was outstanding. Oh, and thank you. Thank you so much. I want to open the floor for anyone that has any questions they would like to share or ask. This is definitely a community-wide situation. One of the things you talked about, um, just the details of some of the reasons and some of those that are most vulnerable in our community. Would you say that the pandemic um, contributed to an increase or did you see any changes during the COVID uh, challenges that we experienced? Any kind of changes? So you know how drug traffickers look for different ways to sneak in the drugs into the country because they become more sophisticated over time. So that's how human traffickers are. They become more sophisticated over time. So we saw that during the pandemic. So the youth moved to everything online. The, the traffickers were able to move more things online. Um, they were able to access more chat rooms, more games, all those video game room, uh, video games that have access to chat app uh, computer games. Um, so that's what we saw more. And then the fear is that there were less people seeking help because people were isolated. Mm -hmm. So it was harder to seek help because everything was about, so those survivors that we would have caught because they would have gone to the emergency room were now now going to the emergency room because of COVID. Um, so that's what we saw more during the pandemic. Wow. You mentioned Maryland. Um, can you give us some of the top states in terms of the number of um, the high numbers of human trafficking? Do you have any of that data? So I don't have a specific number, like who's on the, who's who, one, two, three, four, five. But for mm -hmm. what we know is uh, we have Texas, California, those born, border states. New York, we get in on this side of Maryland, we get a lot of New York, we get a lot of um, the North Carolinas that, that are trafficked over to Maryland. Um, on the other side, there is California, it's a big one, Texas, but again, we have a lot of this information that's going quietly, that is going very hush hush, um, and we that we're not getting the the scope of the number of like how many trafficking survivors are out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm very afraid that the number is a lot bigger than mm -hmm. what we think of. Well, I'm so glad you do what you do. I really am. And I guess I remember when we were about to get the MGM, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of controversy about the impact it would have in terms of human trafficking. Is that something that's definitely of concern? And does that have an increase? or impact on the increased numbers of human trafficking in our community? So I don't have the numbers before and after. Okay. Um, so I don't have the numbers before and after. I know that there is always that there, um, I know that there have that there are concerns like when there's sports events that are coming to uh, cities and things like that. But what we found is that trafficking, this, the same amount of trafficking takes place traffickers do not want the extra attention of a sports event because they know that we are already expecting a lot of trafficking. So why ex why have the extra exposure? So I would think that um, it's, it's, it's the same, you know, sort of requirement. If, if you see a lot of that attention being placed in that, then let's move. You will be surprised. We've had people rescued from homes in very multi-million dollar homes in Potomac. Um, Maryland, homes of ambassadors. So we, and we're sitting here focused and thinking about, okay, the Super Bowl. And meanwhile, the nanny that you're not looking 
paying attention to because she's pushing the you know thousand dollar stroller may be a victim of trafficking because she may be there and cannot leave they took her papers they don't let her use the phone she can communicate with family mm -hmm. she doesn't speak the language she only speaks the language that they understand because mm -hmm. she was brought over with them because they're ambassadors mm -hmm. so you know you have that situation happening that's why it's important for us to inform ourselves and have a good thorough understanding of it wow that's incredible that's incredible any questions from anyone you are well, quiet um, oh, go ahead i'm sorry no uh -uh. please um, well i found that that when you stated about that big number um from the hundreds to thousands, hundred thousands, I kind of thought, I didn't really pay attention to it, uh, how sex trafficking was so big. I didn't realize that it's a big, it, big as it is, it is kind of big or showing itself. The um, so I was like, just sitting here listening, I'm like, oh my gosh, I might have to be more, more attentive when, I, when I'm out and about looking and not be so, you know, it when I'm out looking um because I just I just realized wow it's it's a lot going on out here mm -hmm. so information yeah, yeah and I mean and one of the things that I would give you guys one of the biggest pieces of advice is that if you be careful with be mindful of online of grooming grooming mm -hmm. is, is is a process in which someone is slowly but surely mm -hmm. preparing someone to become like fully the emotionally or psychologically dependent on them mm -hmm. um it, it involves the psychological game of, of isolation um manipulation uh, it involves different aspects but in in terms of grooming we've see, we see that a lot uh, online we see that a lot and it's something that if you have children or if you um, have you that are online a lot is something that you have that is going to be very mindful of if you're looking at signs a lot of the times we worry about stranger danger and we tell our kids don't talk to strangers but um, because we're afraid that they're going to get kidnapped which is a valid fear but we do not teach our kids how to use the internet responsibly mm -hmm. we do not teach ourselves how to you know monitor our kids usage of the internet responsibly like what are they doing what do, because they have access to the world mm. so we have to be able to have those conversations and i i guess we'd have to incorporate some safety tools in their system so we can kind of monitor the activity you're absolutely correct on that that's something to be aware of you mentioned you know in sisters for sisters we're always trying to empower enlighten engage educate how what how would we best serve i mean you mentioned advocating and things of that nature and i think our sister carolyn is on the line are you on sister carolyn yes i'm still okay i wanted them to hear the story on how we connected because it is a community-wide um I don't want to say emergency, but it's an alert. We got to stay attuned. How did we work together? Tell us about your story and your experience with um, the survivor, overcomer of human trafficking. Can yeah. you share? Absolutely. So um, during my off time, I work for a third party ride sharing company. And so I arrive at this hotel and I'm having to use the restroom um, and I saw that it was for gentlemen that I was going to be picking up and so I was like I'm gonna just rush in use the restroom but when um, by the time I pulled up it was a young lady walking to the car but the young lady was dressed in um I guess going out attire just a red uh purplish dress um I can't remember if she had a coat or not but it was just as you mentioned, um, she just wasn't dressed appropriately mm -hmm. for where she was going. And so uh, she got in the car. I was like, oh, hello, how are you? And I spoke with her. And um, so I, I confirmed the address with her. 
And so she was like, you know, yes. And before I could really pull around out of the parking lot, she had stated that she didn't want to go back to where she was going to be dropped off. And so I'm like, well, you know, what's what's going on? And so she began to tell me that um, this guy, her boyfriend, had brought her into town. Um, she was, uh, they had just got into an argument. She just didn't feel safe um, in the home. And, and immediately as she's going, telling me what's going on, she starts crying. And I'm in my mind, mm -hmm. I was like, what in the world? I had never been in a situation like that. So immediately, like, mm. oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? And I remember meeting uh, Dr. Carolyn back at this event, like a long time ago. Um, mm. I was all friends with her on Facebook. And I immediately something said, oh my God, what's up, what's up? you know, domestic violence. That's the first thing I think of. And so, um, while I'm trying, I tell her, I said, well, I can give you a young lady's no, no, and she works with domestic violence. But at the moment, she just, she was like, no, I just need to get back to where I dropped off because the guy, she began to explain, the guy took her wallet, her money. Um, he just did a lot of things. And so in my mind, I was like, well, how did you get over here? And so come to find out, he went out the night before locked her out of the home, um, pretty much leaving her on the back porch. She rallied and got some friends and they were able to put her up into that particular hotel. So making it around the corner, she starts crying again. She was like, I just do not want to go back there. And I was like, look, I started praying. I said, Lord, what should I do? Who do I call? Dr. Carolyn's name got, you know, dropped in my spirit again. And so I was like, look, we about to call. And so I had never had the opportunity or uh, mm -hmm. had the opportunity to call Dr. Carolyn to see how the services work. But um, I called her, she answered the phone number that I asked for. And I said, Dr. Carolyn, I'm in a situation where I need some resources. Uh, the young lady is crying, she doesn't know what to do. I don't, because like I said, I was doing ride sharing. So the guy, he could definitely track where I was. And so that's where we're coming. Like, where are you? Um, you know, you're right around the corner. So I had to tell him, I have to double back because I have to go to the bathroom. You know, so I'm, I'm you know, like, just ask, what should mm. I do? So Dr. Carolyn reaches out. She said, no, don't you dare. You take her back to that hotel and we will, this is what we will, you know, do what we do best. And so um, we came up with it. I took her back to the hotel. We came up with, a game plan, Dr. Carolyn said, what, what can we do? And um, she was like, well, look, we'll take care of you, Carolyn. If you can just come up with a way to get her safely to the airport, because she was trying to find out, she just didn't have any money or anything, because everything had, because she didn't know uh, when he was going to give it back to her, what she was going to do, uh, mm -hmm. she had changed everything all her credit card information, everything. She was not homeless. She was not, um, didn't have any money. She just was like cut off from her reality. She had, she had uh, children, well, one. So she just was here in Maryland for a weekend to spend time with her boyfriend, take care of him. Um, but th just everything started unraveling with that so I was like Lord what in the world so um I stopped driving that and um so that I could be on time and we had agreed to pick her up at a certain time and I met her back because the guy had flown out the guy had just you know he did everything so she whatever she did to keep him off or keep coming to um track her down she did after a while, I had stated that I had agreed to uh, let her board the plane. He bought the plane, or excuse me, he um, paid the plane ticket and everything. And so we was like, if you can check in, you will have a way to catch a flight. Sure enough, um, I met the young lady back at the hotel. Um, it was about six o'clock ish, but I met her back. We was able to get her to the flight and we, you know, we said, do you need money? Do you, what do you need to get home safe and sound? 
she's like, you guys just being mm -hmm. here for service, mm -hmm. this wonderful service by you guys just helping me get to the airport and, and get out of town was all that I needed. And so mm -hmm. got her to planes, got her to the airport safely. Um, she boarded the plane, sent us pictures to say that she was safe. And I think maybe um, that was the last time that I really heard from her. And um, mm -hmm. just recently, her name came back to my house. I said, like, I need to reach out just to make it all as well. But mm -hmm. I think it was Christmas time that she reached out to me. And I'm not for sure she mm -hmm. reached out to you. Mm -hmm. Like maybe last year sometime to okay. say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's the first time I had an experience where it seemed like that there was some type of human mm -hmm. traffic going on. And mm -hmm. this, this and she had to be about maybe 35-ish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the gentleman, she had stated that he was in um, some type of medical field. And so mm -hmm. he really didn't want the risk mm -hmm. of um, going. She said it wasn't, she really didn't know what was going on. They had been dating, online dating. And this was maybe the first or the second time that she had been here and then this is where everything started mm. it was a it was a eye-opening moment mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah wow. so thank you I, uh, thank you again for uh dr carol for you opening up you know answering that phone that day because i mm -hmm. wouldn't i, I, no. I wouldn't know what sources to quickly call and get the, her her taken care of so thank you so much no, thank you so much because you definitely identified that there was an issue and you stepped in with your courageous self and you made things happen. I'm just so grateful to be a part of what you did. You did an outstanding job. And that's, I guess, what we all need to stay alert and stay awakened. And so I just thank you so much and so grateful for your support. Yeah. Oh, you're well, I just wanted to, again, thank you all. Is somebody speaking? I'm sorry. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi, Carolyn. This is Frida. Um, hey, Frida. Hey, Carolyn and everyone that's on the line. Um, with all this that's going on, I'm talking to the guests that, you know, that, that was talking about human trafficking. trafficking. With, with all this going on, how how... How would I really know if if somebody's in trouble? I mean, because you know, people it's pretending nowadays. So hmm. how how because yeah, like I say, it's pretenders out here. So how would I really know? You know, I don't want to turn my back on nobody, but how would I really know? You know, the way things going on, people would get you and kill you. So how, I mean, how how would I really know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So unless it's a situation. That the, where you're able and that's how I was explaining that um it is it's, pain, it's like painting a picture right where mm -hmm. you need to have more than one um one factor in order for it to to make sense if a person really doesn't want you to know a lot of the times the way to help them is different than by reporting their trafficking right um or the way to assist um may not be the 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 way that you're thinking of like intervening. Um, so on, to know for 100% for sure, unless that you, you're able to paint that picture, you won't know, mm -hmm. right? So that's uh -huh. one. But in order to help, we don't always need to know because we okay. can help in different ways. Right, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. We definitely want to stay aware. I'm sorry, someone was asking a question, comment. Okay, I just don't want to cut anyone off. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Hey, Carolyn, this is West Coast Rita. I want to commend you for the amazing speaker that you had presenting all the information to us today. And we do have to be vigilant and we have to stay alert because the victim may only get to 
reach out for help one time. And unfortunately, I don't have, um, I'm driving now, but there's a hand signal that some of them use to let you know that they're in trouble. Maybe your esteemed guest could show them that hand signal. Oh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the hand signal you're referring to. I don't know. I don't know okay. of the hand signal, but Rita, if you have it, please share it if it's recorded somewhere, but not while you're driving, of course. Oh, <laughs> trust me, I, I, I plan on getting to my destination. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, if you could send it to us, I'll definitely communicate it on our website or what have you. But yes, we definitely had an uh, amazing guest. Sister Jatna was just outstanding and such a blessing. And I appreciate her. And I thank my sister, Dr. Denise McCain of the Family Justice Center for recommending this highly esteemed and very educated on the subject guest. And Ms. Gomez, I'm looking forward to us working together again on some other things. We have a passion for our youth. So I'm excited about that. And I, I just really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you again so very much for joining us on this Thursday evening where you could be getting ready for your Friday night weekend or something. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And I, you have my contact information now. You don't need Dr. McCain. You can always contact me if you need anything. And if I'm, if I'm able to help, I'm happy to do so or find someone that can help you. Well, we are so excited. And I never knew anything about the Safe Center until this evening. So I am extremely grateful for the great work that's being done right in my community. It makes me really Prince George's County proud, as our um, county executive would say. Um, before we close tonight, I know we're over our time a little bit, but I don't leave anybody out. If anyone has any last comments or thoughts before we close for the evening, please share. Well, on behalf of Sisters for Sisters Incorporated and our love movement, we are grateful for everyone who joined in and tuned in tonight. And we thank again our special guest. And we thank you, Sister Rita. We think that's your, your system, but I, no, we're not going to blame you on all these colors going up. I'm just very grateful that you all were able to come in and let's stay alert and bring this presentation to your sorority, your business organization, your church, so that we as a community can be more equipped and educated. I thank you again for joining us for tonight's Love Talk, and we look forward to joining us again next month. Have a wonderful and great weekend and a safe one to everyone. God bless.